So uh, I have too many slides for the time provided. We have gone through a lot of this material, and so I will flip through some of it very quickly. Uh, something I'll probably talk about a little bit more tomorrow when we talk about how we digitally catalog things is I want us to keep in mind that whenever we're doing this uh, <laughs> material, <laughs> uh, we should probably be thinking about it in a digital preservation planning mindset. And so we need to know uh, what aspects of our project are important to our users. Uh, we call significant properties, right? And that means we need to identify our user groups. We need to know who our stakeholders are. We need to know what they uh, need out of it. Uh, so with all of this digitization stuff, as you've seen, there's so much possible. You can have an entire room full of uh, beautiful digitization equipment, but probably you have a budget. Probably you have time constraints. So maybe this doesn't suit your needs. And so one of the things that I'd like people to take away for digitization is, um, you know, sometimes you just need text. You just need a plain text. So maybe uh, every possible fancy TEI uh, cataloging thing is not what you need. Uh, sometimes a uh, cell phone image will do for a researcher. Uh, and that's actually just become really common now that many libraries allow it through. But when we are designing plans for how we are going to digitize our manuscripts, how we're going to do uh, our cataloging in TEI or whatever other system we have chosen. Um, if we start out without thinking about who our user groups are and what they need, we're probably going to overcreate in some areas and undercreate in others. So the first thing we should always be doing is thinking about what is significant to preserve. And I like this as an example because um, Ethiopian manuscripts, which is my specialty field, started out with microfilms of uh, the manuscripts. They had a microfilm machine they took to Addis Ababa, and they brought manuscripts down to Addis Ababa. They took microfilms back uh, and they, of them, and then they sent the copies of the microfilms to various repositories and... St. Louis, the Vatican, wherever else, and they might look something like this. Now, most Ethiopianists are philologists. For their purposes, is this readable? Yes, it's perfectly readable. It's maybe not quite as readable as a modern digital image, but there's no problem. A big problem for me, as someone who deals with cover decoration, is that because they were interested in the text, they thought it was unnecessary to image the covers. So this is big collection of all of these early uh, manuscript images, and none of them have covers. Um, this is not actually a black and white image, though. That was just me messing it up in Photoshop in order to look like one of these images. Um, but obviously, we get very different information from the color image that will serve different audiences. As someone who's interested in scribal practice, I am generally much more interested in what colors appear in the manuscripts because the different shades of red, orange that appear are useful for telling you what the materials are. And in some cases, they're distinct enough to tell you a general idea of when the manuscript is because we start seeing uh, this distinctly purplish um, presumably imported mass market uh, red dye that becomes used in later manuscripts. And of course, that information is completely obliterated by the black and white copy we've seen. So for a purely textual point of view, the black and white was fine. Uh, for some projects, that's great. Uh, for me, if you were consulting me as one of your potential users, I would always want the color. Generally, we were always going to preserve the color because it's actually very low overhead for us right now. So it's an easy choice to make. There's a lot of potential uses, and it doesn't cost us much extra. But uh, as I said, philologists have different interests in manuscripts than art historians, and that creates very different things. There's this British Library manuscript of Luttrell Salter. They have a beautiful digital interactive exhibit with, but the only thing you can zoom in on is like the birds and the other little art stuff. 
because they decided that people who wanted to see Luttrell Salter wanted to see the art. And so there I am frustrated, like manuscript historian going like, zoom me in on the text, and I can't zoom in on the text. So just keep in mind that in that case, they probably know their audience. That's probably what people are interested in for Luttrell Salter. Maybe that isn't, but that's a decision that's made. And I just encourage you to think about who is it being preserved for? Who is it being preserved by? What are the capacities of the people who are doing it, right? There is no cloud. There's just servers that are here and there. Where are your servers? Are they in the same building? What happens if your building's on fire? Are they in the same city? What happens if your city is flooded? Are they in the same country? What happens if Russia invades your country, right? These are real things that exist somewhere, so you need to consider who is it being preserved by, what is the funding stream for doing that. Um, so all of these decisions about what is significant exist in a context of intended current and future audiences. Um, so we've covered some of this. Uh, following up on what Pia said, a raw file is approximately one megabyte per megapixel. Rule of thumb. It varies. Uh, a TIFF file, which is one of the more common formats we actually store in, is six times that size, starting, right? Um, on the other hand, something like a JPEG 2000 format, which is something that many archivists consider useful as an archival format, is perhaps half the size of the original RAW file. So you already have a big workflow decision. Are we keeping every file that our workflow creates, which is really common, or are we at some point limited by the amount of storage we have and we need to cut down? Also, are we limited by bandwidth? I work with Ethiopia. I had to make a low, cop a low resolution version of my thesis in order to send it uh, to, at the time, bad internet connections in Ethiopia so that Ethiopian professionals and students could use it when I published it. It's open access, but it's also 170 megabytes. Internet access has improved greatly since then, but at the time that was a huge issue. Now, I'm again often the person that you're not designing your preservation plan around, which is why I run into problems like this. These are cover images, which if you look at the entire cover, are perfectly understandable. If you just want to see, is that a cover? What does it look like? You can see it. The moment, however, you want to start cataloging the actual binding decoration on the cover and you've got all these little tiny zones that you're trying to look at, you run into, hey, their focus wasn't that, it wasn't that out of focus, but it was out of focus enough that small details start disappearing. Uh, you run into weird color and lighting issues. So if you were digitizing covers for Madguas, for Sean, basically, you would be digitizing them very differently. That comes into raking light that was represented earlier, but also covers into sometimes more megapixels do matter, right? Sometimes you really do need all the megapixels, and sometimes you don't. And you really need to understand your products in their services. Also, you're creating metadata about the images you're creating, right? So it's not just primary metadata of your manuscripts. It's metadata about all the images, all the decisions you've made, and then there's metadata about the workflow about this. What are you preserving, right? So we might often be conditioned to think we are just keeping manuscript cataloging data, but you're generating all this other data and you need to know what you're comfortable throwing out because likely you will throw out a lot of it because it is a never ending cascade about data, about data decisions, and so on. Uh, and that's something that you should document. And then we get into something that I wanted people to consider, which is physical properties and technical properties. So when we consider color space, if we look here, here is what we can print on matte paper, high quality matte paper, right? Here is what we can see on an sRGB, a very normal monitor, right? Here is what we can store in Adobe RGB, uh, a file format, a, a color format, and here is the preferred format Profoto RGB. And then there's all this other range of colors that we can't really even effectively store. 
So I'm storing stuff in Profoto RGB. I have all these great colors. And then I'm looking at them on that monitor, which is a Dell that we mass purchased for the university. Uh, what is the color range of that monitor? It's much closer to sRGB. So if I'm making editing decisions on that monitor, I am editing Profoto RGB based upon sRGB. So you really just need to keep that in mind. What are people actually seeing? On the other hand, you have not a lot of control in many cases because most people don't have color managed devices. But when you're deciding to keep all these extra pieces of information, think about what is actually going to be available in practical use. Things like MOR filters. MOR filters are on most cameras. They're actually actively bad most of the time. They're making your images worse. Until you have a finely textured fabric or somebody wearing fine vertical pinstripes, in which case they make the image look right, whereas before you would get all this weird discoloration, right? This is a physical limitation about the way our cameras are working that we need to keep in mind. You have very different requirements if you're photographing fine fabrics or they're fine details with repeating patterns than if you're not. In some cases, you might want to remove the MAR filter if you really are sure that you never are going to have MAR effects in your camera. Uh, I, would, I adapted these slides from a year-long course, so I'm going to skip over a lot, but there are a lot of things you need to consider that are not just digital, right? Is somebody going to be offended if you put this manuscript online? Do you care if they're offended? Are you legally obligated to care if they're offended, right? These are three very important questions, right? Somebody might be offended and you might not care, but legally they are protected in being offended and suddenly that is a problem. You can't just say, this is entirely my decision. We exist within legal and ethical circles uh, where we need to consider uh, communal values in these. Uh, is there something in presenting this that might cause a uh, backlash at your institution, at the object, or at people involved. Basic research ethics questions that we don't necessarily think about when we're doing digital preservation planning, but we need to. Who is doing the work? I think uh, Pia really gave you a good example of the people and who they are and their different technical needs, but you need to consider, uh, are you using the people with the right capacities? Do they have the knowledge and tools they need? Is that something you need to provide? Or is that something that maybe is just outside of your range for certain specific technical or highly uh, ethically problematic tasks? And then I thought this was actually a great way of talking about the whole, what are we preserving when we're preserving multispectral imaging things, right? Because you can make scans of the slides that go into a stereoscope viewer but what are you doing to actually show people? We see these online and there's two images right next to each other. I'm like, I don't think that really conveys any of what we get out of a stereoscope viewer. You have to look at them through a stereoscope viewer. Uh, so what does our preservation plan say about how we're actually going to preserve uses? Uh, and then of course we talk about these in terms of emulation, migration, and the so-called museum solution. The museum solution is we are committing to always keeping the technology that works with it in the intended way working, which has problems. Our entire banking system, however, is also based upon this, right? Which is why COBOL programmers, uh, long after COBOL ceased to be a majority language for getting well paid by banks, so that they could maintain their ancient critical architecture because it was much easier to maintain working old architecture that did what it was supposed to and was legally compliant than to create new systems. Um, emulation and migration both have issues in terms of loss or different performance. And when we're talking about what are the considerations that we might need to take before we actually put something under the camera, this is something that we're hoping to do with our colleagues at Klagenfurt. Uh, I hope you can see that there is an undertext on this papyrus, and that is what they are interested in studying. But the moment we put this, before we even put this under the multispectral camera, we need to consider, well, how is the papyrus going to react, one, 
But how is the glass going to react? What is the housing material for this? I can't tell from looking at it. Sometimes this is in soda glass, sometimes acrylic, sometimes vinyl. Soda glass is opaque to IR. So suddenly we just have a black glass plate in our pictures. Acrylic is treated to be UV opaque, so it's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum that it's a problem for. And vinyl doesn't look good in the visible spectrum. This looks good in the visible spectrum. I think it's not vinyl, but who knows. Um, how are reflections managed? We don't actually have uh, the specific filter that you use uh, for controlling polarization on our setup. So is that going to be a problem in our setup? Uh, is it possible to take it out of the glass? Is it advisable? Who, from an institutional perspective, has to be there to take it out of the glass, to put it back in? Does that fit into their conservation priorities? All of these need to be nailed down before somebody puts this in a suitcase, into a car, drives over to Graz, and we put it under our camera. And you're always going to have issues like this that you need to consider before doing it. I realize I'm way over time. I hope you'll bear with me for five more minutes. Uh, but this is about the physical limitations and the objectivity of the camera. Cameras are not human eyes. They're doing what we've programmed them or designed them to do, which is not necessarily what we would always expect or what we'd want. So uh, I said earlier that we have the sensor and then we have this IR filter and this MOIR filter that we have removed on our setup, right? Uh, so that we are just going directly to the sensor. And part of that is because we can see the sensor has variable responses over different uh, ranges uh, in the spectra. So that also means that because of the different spectral characteristics and its response on this particular sensor, and you need to know your sensor, um, you need to know how you're going to compensate each image based upon the various types of light. And here's what I was talking about earlier. Here, this is the buyer pattern. So uh, red, blue, two greens, because uh, green is actually the least responsive of the sensor. So immediately, to make one color, right, you have four pixels. So if you were capturing different color channels, you are automatically using all four of those pixels for the exact color that you are capturing, which is a very different way of doing it than the type of camera that we normally use. Because um, remember, this is actually what a photodial looks like. We don't see it, it's very small, but it's basically an electrical circuit that says, did I get hit by a photon and get a charge? Yes, no, right? And then all of that gets amalgamated into an image but it gets amalgamated based upon a scale which doesn't necessarily immediately make sense. So this is a photo I took. It's not a great image. I kind of like it for this specific thing because you can see there's a lot of detail in this rabbit that's under the light. And there's no detail in the background, which is just black. This was taken to Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk while I was walking there at night. It was perfectly lit for walking around. Like it was dark but there was no problem for us because our human law eye sees about 20 stops of dynamic range, which is the, where we can you know, change on a camera. When you're pushing your button, you're changing how many stops up and down over my exposure range am I going. Traditional negafilm had seven in many cases. Digital cameras of the type that we're generally using have 10 to 12. Some of the really high end digital backs have something like 26, but then you run into, they're slow, they create huge files. Do they work into your workflow? If you're doing the giant Rembrandt in the Rijks Museum, yes, they 100% fit into your workflow. You want huge amounts of detail. If you're doing 300 folios of a manuscript, it probably doesn't. In fact, the HML started out using a Hasselblad medium format back, and they said it was way more megapixels than we needed, and it was incredibly slow and they switched over to what we use, which is kind of the prosumer grade of camera, especially since cameras change so fast. You know, not committing to a very expensive one and changing it as technology goes up works. So that's because if we look at the linear distribution of what's happening, half of all the actual digital data is stored in the highlights, right? This rabbit 
has as much actual data in it as most of the rest of the image, right? Because overwhelmingly we capture detail in the highlights. If we look at the blackest colors, they're this tiny little sliver at the bottom. Now, since there is cosmic radiation, which is also hitting your sensor, what we would call noise, the signal to noise ratio on the highlights is great. Like there's no noise in the highlights, right? The signal to noise ratio in the darks is terrible, which is why when you see color noise in a photograph, you see it in the darker areas, especially if you then pull up uh, to brighten in order to show the dark areas, they become awful and grainy and the like. Just a reminder, light has color. You don't use two different colored lights when photographing a manuscript because the camera will see it even if you don't. Your eye adjusts amazingly, but this is the same building. Daylight, and it's lit by tungsten at night. The storm is a different color of light, right? It's really apparent in an image taken in a camera, and it would not 100% be apparent with the eye. Of course, this is why it's good practice to include in your image a color checker card. These days, the only really important one is the white. Right, you can click on the white with the eyedropper tool in most photo applications and it will automatically white balance it. So if the white's good and it's not overexposed, everything's good. Somebody mentioned raking lights. Can somebody point out the marginal notes on this page? This was taken by a friend's cell phone camera. Here? Here? Okay, you found one of them. That's excellent. There's actually two. They're done in blind point. There's no way that our normal, extremely soft setup is going to capture this, right? Because we are privileging having good contrast between the uh, parchment and the ink. We're privileging making an overall pleasing aesthetic experience and capturing the most common things. But then you get weird stuff like this. Soft light's actually terrible because you can only see the shadows in blind point. So you need a hard, low angle raking light in order to put shadows in it. Gold is also a problem, she mentioned it. Gold leaf often looks terrible uh, in photos when it looks amazing in real life. I will skip playing this, but check out the RTI viewer on the Heritage Imaging website, and you will see that as you pull around this bar, you can see all of the different shining of the light because they're capturing, oh, sorry, they're capturing all the different light sources you see here. Are you going to do RTI on every single one of your manuscripts that has a gold page? Probably not. Somebody presented a great workflow where you could do multispectral and RSI of every page of a manuscript, which is creating like 26 images per page. And I'm going like, whose workflow does this work into? Maybe his, maybe some really deluxe manuscript everyone loves. Probably not your workflow. Um, so this is color channels just in red, green, and blue. I was just gonna try and soft launch into the introduction. We covered most of this in multispectral. This is the diagram I wanted to show you about where this is what we see invisible. We see the colors we expect, but then there's no actual color differences in some of these other channels because we're not seeing color anymore right, because color is just what is the spectral characteristics in visible light, right, and these pigments have different spectral characteristics under invisible light, and some of them have fluorescence that you need a completely separate uh, piece in order to check. So to do multispectral, you actually need a different color checker card, but that does allow you to do interesting things like this workflow, uh, the workflows from a paper, which you can see here, where they're taking all these different samples of blues and they're trying to figure out what spectral characteristics can you use to identify them in a workflow. And for here, you can see that uh, the cobalt-based blue under this uh, infrared light uh, has an inverse relationship to the other blues. Uh, so if you see one of these blues turning white and all the other blues turning black, you know the one white one is the cobalt blue. It doesn't actually tell you much about the other blues, right? Which is why it's a workflow. You've got to keep going down. 
And I did mention that you can do things, even simple things sometimes in Photoshop where you use the subtract, divide, multiply filters to take the different channels and show them. Here's a great example of somebody uh, using uh, the uh, divide filter. Uh, and what you see here is this white text, which is kind of hard to read, has the black text uh, basically taken out of it. And then you get the white text against the black background and suddenly it's so much more readable. Right, so there are simple processing steps. There are complex processing steps. There's a variety of different ways you can do it. You will need to process this data. It does need to be part of your workflow. Multispectral images are not as immediately useful on their own as visible light images you see. And of course, at the fancy end, you get these wonderful false color images where they've taken and mapped different characteristics over different images into different colors, all in the same images. So in this case, the one text shows up as blue and the otherwise invisible undertext shows up as red. Um, so that is a different approach uh, to the same issue. And these are all just workflows that people have been working on and are still working on. Here's another example from the HMML where they're trying to show, uh, I don't read any of this, so they're trying to show the parts that uh, are now readable that weren't readable before, but I couldn't read it in the first place. Uh, here's a couple places that are trying to develop like best practices workflows you could think about. Uh, these are not the only ones. A lot of this is just going into small publications, often from uh, collaborative teams of scientists and humanists who are still actively working on and developing these things. But even if we're not photographers, we should be thinking about what are the, not only the larger characteristics of our audience, but we should also be thinking of what are the physical limitations of what we can do, as well as the technical limitations of what our library can store. So I am very sorry for going over time. Let's uh, go directly to lunch at this point. Thank you for your attention.